السلام عليكم ان شاء الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه اللهم علمنا ما ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا انك سميع مجيب الدعاء اللهم اني اعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع وقلب لا يخشع ونفس لا تشبع ودعاء لا يسمع ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي جزاكم الله خير ابري وان فور كومينج ابولوجي فور ذا ديلي بيكوز اي برايد ات هوم اكشولي سو ان شاء الله نيكست ويك ويل دو ات ات 8 سو ايفريبدي كان براي كومفورتابلي سو يو نو ذا سبجكت ان اونستلي اي دونت نو وات ام غانا سي اتس ذيرز نو ووردز تو ديسكرايب وات اي سو ان ليفد ات واز 8 دايز ان غزه اتسلف And it was two days of travel. One day it took to arrive, and was one day they moved us. And there you don't argue at all. Whatever they tell you, you do. Just to give you an example, we were in Deir el Balah, the Mustashfa um, Shuhada al Aqsa, the martyrs of al Aqsa. It's the only still functioning, if you want to use this word, in the middle of Gaza. Because Gaza, there is three parts. It's the north where Gaza city. And there is the middle, which is Deir Balah. And then there's the south, which is Rafah, which now everyone is talking about. It. We ended up also in Rafah one day. So the um, what I saw from the day we arrived in the border to the trip, and just to give you an idea, we arrived one hour before the World Kitchen car. And they took exactly the same road we took. We arrived at 8 o'clock to the hospital. They brought them dead at 9 o'clock to the same hospital. It's the thing I'm, I'm going to try. The reason I'm, I'm speaking about it and I'm going to speak about it in Dallas and Sunday we have a program with the two, um, the physician and the nurse who went with me from SoCal, is not only to make you feel sad. Sad is not the word. There is no word to describe the feelings. What you are seeing is nothing. Whatever is on the social media is nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean it because I lived it. What I want you all to do is two things. And this is the main, actually three things, because I asked everybody there, what do you want from us? What do you think they said? Speak about it and tell people that we exist and that we are not leaving. And this is our land. It's everyone. I spoke, you name it, because I speak Arabic, so it was much easier. So whoever I see, I speak to. And I'm going to share whatever I can share with you, because, and then inshallah, on Sunday we have presentation. We're going to put pictures and, and videos. First thing I want to tell everybody is when you want something, Allah will give it to you. From the day I heard that there is groups going to Gaza as physicians, I wanted to go. And I can't tell you how many applications I felt. No one answered. And I was like, subhanAllah, ya Allah, you don't want me to go. There is a reason. And then just the second day of Ramadan, as I was flying to uh, Jeddah, a friend of mine said, fill this application. So I filled and I thought this is going to happen. And 10 days I didn't hear from them. And I was like, subhanAllah, again, ya Allah, you don't want me to go. And I hear people going and coming back, I have friends who went. And then finally, subhanAllah, made me remember. This is why I want, I'm sharing this story with you. He made me remember. There was a post on a group I am with for this, in maybe three weeks before I remembered, that there is a physician who went there, they put her picture, and she was saying all these things. And they put her phone number in that group. I just texted her. And I said, is there a group going? I want to go. And she said, oh, Haifa Yunus? You really want to go? And I said, yeah, I do. She said, okay, um, I can take you on the 15th this week. Now a group already left. I said, I can't. I only have the last 10 days of Ramadan because that's the only time I take vacation. I have to be back on the 15th for work. And she says, I don't know. We have to, there's a lot of approvals. It's not like you just decide and you go. She said, you know what? I'm going to apply. We're going to have to have approval from one and two and three and four. And even when you get to Egypt, put in your mind that you may end up not getting to Egypt or you will not get to Gaza. There's nothing guaranteed. They keep reminding you. There's nothing guaranteed. And I said, fine, I'll do it. 
So I fly, walillah alhamd, arrived in Egypt, walillah alhamd. Next morning, we left the hotel at 4 a.m. Is stations, they have to make sure you are checking a lot of issues. We ended up in the hospital at 8 p.m. The journey took about 14 hours. And we were, walillah alhamd, all of us were fasting. That journey, other than it's long, it wasn't an issue. You haven't seen anything yet. Before we left, they said, expect nothing. This is actually the messages we were getting. There's no food. Literally, they said, there's no food. Bring with you whatever dry you can eat. So we all packed protein bars. And then take something to make the water healthy to drink. So the, it's like capsules. So that's what we packed. And then they said, anything else you can bring that you give it to people. And that's what everybody did. So we arrived at 8 o'clock, 8 p.m. It was dark. There's no electricity for six months. Since October 7, there's no electricity in that part of the world. And the reason the hospital has because there is a generator. So we entered. We couldn't see much because it was dark. They took us to a building, which was the hospital administration. And we get there, exactly 8 p.m. What were they doing? Absolutely, in Jama'a. We dropped our bags because no one welcomed us. We dropped our bags and we joined the Jama'a. So they did Aisha, right? And they did all Taraweeh. And every Ruk'ah in Taraweeh, I had no idea who was leading, but everybody was reading better than the other. They changed. Then I came to know who they are. Every Ruk'ah, they, they read two or three ayah. They didn't do it too long. You can't because there is noise on top. I didn't know what it is. There's a constant noise above us. Every verse in the Quran that talks about patient, steadfasting, Jannah, you heard it. Amazing. Amazing fiqh, amazing knowledge. And I was like overwhelmed. And everybody in scrubs. So it turned to be the, the um, director of the hospital, the director of the nursing, all the big people in the hospital were the leaders. A room, alhamdulillah, I mean, the room, this is a palace. This is a palace to what I saw. And he welcomed us and said, I'm sure you all are hungry. Of course we're hungry. We had only dates and it's Ramadan. He said, okay, we prepared iftar for you in your rooms. Me and you iftar in the room. And I have pictures, we're gonna show it to you on Sunday. And he said, we're not gonna, I'm sure you're all very tired. They get, 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 gave us dates and a coffee, which is something is like you pay a million dollars to get. Said, let's go and rest and tomorrow we will take you and we'll start the work, okay? So go to the room. What is the room? I have pictures of it. Me and we, it was me and another physician from DC and then, then the men. So they put us in the room. You have two options. Either you sleep or you sleep because you're exhausted. And then they knocked on the door after and they said the iftar. And the iftar was one can of hummus and one can of beans. And because it is us, they got us a bread. So of course we're hungry, so I ate. Spent the whole night throwing up. Yeah, the spoiled woman coming from America. That's who, who we are. That's who we are. I, I'm, I'm sharing the reality with you. And then, alhamdulillah, we woke up in the morning, right? Don't, don't ask me about the bathroom. Don't ask me. Next door opened, and a woman comes, up, comes out, literally next door, dressed, of course, I didn't see a hair in the 10 days. Allah is my witness. I did not see any woman not covered, covered properly. I didn't see jeans. I didn't see anything. If anything, there was scrubs of the hospital. On top of it is the white coat. So the woman opened the door welcoming us, and she says, me, me, this and this. I'm actually a surgeon, but I'm displaced from the north for the last six months, and I'm living in this room. The room is a little bit bigger than where I am sitting. Half of it is stuff. We don't know what it is. She and her son. Where is your husband and the rest of the family? 
they stayed in the north. They didn't want to leave the house. Do you still in contact? She said, yeah, sometimes we do, sometimes you are smiling, surgeon. And she said, welcome to Gaza. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Next day, they took us to the tour, and here we start. How many of you are physicians here in this room? How many of you have been in hospitals for whatever the reason, right? Normally, when you enter a hospital, what do you see? Right? There's usually an entrance, a parking place, right? Norm. And there is some maybe, maybe grass, maybe flowers, cleanliness. And then there is the main entrance of the hospital. There's usually corridors, right? No. Not in Gaza. It was all tents. From the door open up till I get to the, there's two main buildings. One is the ER and the hospital. And the second building was used to be the maternity hospital. They changed it completely, the trauma center. It's like this and this. From here, this is the gate. From here to here, it's all tents. Sometimes you say, please excuse me, I need to move. All these people are human beings like you and me. And they are living in these tents. Then you enter, and on my left, and I see this simple mattress on the floor, and there's a woman in her 50s. I paid attention. I was like, literally on the door, like on the door. I didn't speak to her at that day yet. So we went, and they start showing us the hospital. What do I see? I have actually a video of it. When you get to the second floor, because that's where we are going to be mainly working, you start seeing the hospital beds. And what is on these hospital beds? Every injured person. Most of them have no limbs. The target is on the legs and the hands. And Dr. Jawadi will, he will show, there is pictures. I said, don't put it. This is too graphic. But most of the young men, the target is toward their legs. It's, it's amazing cruelty. Amazing cruelty, subhanAllah. And you turn on the right, you see this. You turn on the left, you see this. Then we go and says, this is the place for the children. Where is the children? Then you go to the NICU, the only clean place where the NICU, she said, those were from before we closed the maternity. And it was looking okay, alhamdulillah. Then they said, let's go to the ER. And they said, I'm an OBGYN, so she, the OBGYN hospital is about 15 minutes from here, but we don't think it's safe for you to go there, so we'll keep you in the hospital, and any emergency comes to the ER, you'll take care of it. I said, okay, whatever you say, I'll do. I'm here to help any way you, you see me. So we go to the ER. That scene, I, I, I've never seen. So to get to the ER... This is the building. You have to go through. This is all tents. You have to go through a, a, like a corridor. The corridor on the right, on the left, people on the floor. It's like you are sitting. I don't know these are displaced. I don't know these are family. I don't know these are patients. I have no idea who these people are. Every age you see. A lot of women, a lot of children, but also you see much less older people and definitely much less younger men. Then you enter, and this was supposed to be the ER. Literally, like you are now, if I want to walk, I have to say, please excuse me, please excuse me. People are moaning, people are bleeding. It's beyond. Then they took us to, they said, the ER, they took us to the head of the ER department. His room is smaller than this. I don't know how the man is functioning, honestly. All these people who are head of departments in that hospital. They have not gone to their home, slept in their home since October 7. Everybody, everyone was telling me, especially in Ramadan, we may go for two weeks, for two hours, break the fast and come back. Don't tell me shower. Don't tell me shower, there's no water. We were lucky because we were in a hospital. I don't know what they did, but everybody was clean, at least the people who are working in the hospital. So we go in there, and they said that he was ex explaining to us that the ER is divided now because of this into three parts, green, yellow, and red. The green is, is like outpatient, yellow is less serious, and the red is the ICU. The ICU, I went there. Again, I have a picture of it. And look at me. I was like, okay, there's a patient vaginal bleeding. Can you give me a glove? They look at me. 
they do. And normally here, you say size small or medium or large. And I need a sterile glove, not in Gaza. Whatever they give you, take it. Large, I said, give it to me. There's nothing under the bed of this woman. Nothing. There's no sheet. It, it's, it's, I can't tell you. So I examined her, and alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, and the family was with her. It wasn't something serious. As I was examining her next, like a curtain next, they just brought somebody who was, because the norm is they bring people who are, have uh, been bombed, shell, you name it. So they brought, I don't know, but I'm hearing the person with her. She was, I think, a young girl. The one with her, the one, the, the girl was like not shouting, but she was crying. She was in pain. The person next to her was reading to her Quran and says, this is not what we do when we are in pain. This is what we do when we are in pain. Wahidillah. This is, you keep hearing this. And the real Muslims, you hear them. Wahidillah. Say la ilaha illallah. And he reads Quran to her. Subhanallah. Then I met the first physician who I spoke to, who I posted yesterday on the social media. He's an orthopedic resident. Highly, highly educated. And when you, literally, you can sit with this young man for hours speaking. And I, I said, what do you feel? I asked him, actually. You know, from everybody. We are in a survival mode. We don't have a time to cry for the people we lost. You know when you hear this, like, like look at your faces, imagine I'm hearing this. And in front of me, and I see around me, blood everywhere, injured everywhere. And then he said, and I kept asking people, if you go back to the October 7, do you want it to be different? Majority said no. You will be so surprised. They said, because somebody has to do something. Someone has to remind people we exist. Someone has to people who are in jail, in an open jail. Yes, we were living okay. We were living in good, good, not by my and your standard. I mean, there was food, there was family, there was relatively peace. But somebody has to know that this part of earth belongs to us and they need to know we exist. Subhanallah. They took me and I said, take me to see more people. So there was one of the representatives in the hospital. He said, you want to go to a camp? And I said, yes, take me out. We cannot move a lot. So we have to go just by walking. So I walked and maybe less, less than five minutes, like from this building to the next building. In the street, there is no services in that part of the world. Garbage is on the street. And this is all planned. This is all, the plan is to make it inhabitable. So they leave and they don't want to leave. Everyone looks at me and says, go where? They told us go to the, to the south. They told us leave the north, you will be safe. Here we are and we are not safe. And we're going to go to the south and we are not safe. Where do we go? And somebody like Circassia says, yeah, you can go to Egypt. Go to Egypt, do what? So they're staying. They said, that's it. We will die. We will die. P people have to die for a cause. And we're all going to die. This is how they speak. Then I had this woman. So I, I said, Get, I need to talk to, to people who were in the They did not let us go to the north. Absolutely. We, as I said, Gaza is north, middle, and the south is Rafah, no, middle where we were. And the north is where the beginning of the war. A Shifa hospital, you all have heard about it, right? So this woman said, I lived in, she was giving us all the, it's a, it's a long video, um, and we're trying to translate, and then I will post it, bi So a young woman came to me, she's probably not 40, so eloquent, and this is the amazing thing, they all speak very well. They speak eloquent. And, and I said, tell me your story. And she said, well, we lived in a, in the north, and she gave me the place, which turned to be a very good neighborhood. And then they dropped on us papers, says leave. And they sometimes give them two minutes only. And I asked one of them, what do you take in this two minutes? 
She said, whatever we can grab, because we cannot go heavy, because we are walking. So normally we go out with one bag. Imagine this is you and me in the house, and someone says, leave. What are you going to take with you? So I, I said, okay. So she said, we left from our home, and we went. That's from October 7. Then we went to, they said, go to this place. We went, stayed there for two months. I said, okay, and then, and she said, the bombing start, and they said, move. So we moved. She, four of her kids, and the husband. I said, where did you go? She said, a friend who's Christian, and he is living in the church. He said, use my house. So we stayed in the house. Two months. And says, well, okay in the beginning. By the last 10 days, she start, we start hearing, they know every artillery, every war machine. They know the name, and they know how it sounds. She said, we start seeing and hearing the tanks. And they are calling in Arabic and sometimes in a broken Arabic, leave. And she says, where do we go? Where do we go? Right? This is a very educated woman. I mean, she captured my attention for about 10 minutes when she's saying her story. She said, we stayed because, and then she said, I responded, we are civilians. I, we are not Hamas, we are not Fatah, we are civilians. And she says, they start bombing everywhere. She kept looking at me and says, I don't know how I'm alive and talking to you. Everywhere they have certain machines or certain technology where they can know there is a living blood, moving blood. So they know the person is alive. And she says, you see it on top, we go down. They go down, we go up. I know how I am alive and me and my family. And then all where we were, the house of the Christian man is all done except two walls. Then they came. They came to her and they said, they separate us. They put them, my husband and, his, and her son, 19-year-old, and put the girls on the side. They stripped the, the husband and the son in front of the family. And then they, you know the pictures you saw? And then they put band, band on their eyes, and they took them. Before they took them, they looked at her and says, you go south. And then she was very smart. She took her daughter, she walked, and then she said, to her daughter, so her husband knows where they are going, because she said, once, if he's going to be alive, and they will let him go, he needs to know where are we. She said, two, three days before this, I heard that people are going to the hospital where we are, so I decide I'm going to go to that hospital. So I looked at her daughter and says, we are going to the hospital, and she put the name of the hospital, so the husband knows. She said, he kicked me, the, the soldier, he knew what she was doing. For nine days, this woman, she said, we didn't eat. I, I, I don't know how they survived it. Other than, she said, the only thing was in that house, sugar cubes and a little bit of water. So whenever the children are hungry, I give them a little bit of sugar cubes. Then we had to leave because they told us leave. And he kept, she kept saying, now when you go to Gaza, Gaza is on the sea. So here you go, it's, and we walked it actually, but not from the north. It's a, a, a seashore, you walk. And then in here, because of the war, they put like all sand, small like hillies. And she said, the soldiers were on the hill and they asked us to walk after 8 p.m., so cold, and we were all barefooted. And I said, how much you walked? She said, 10 kilos. It's like more than five miles. So at one point, that young man, young boy, his name is Mu'min, 12 years old, he said, I can't go anymore. I'm starving. He ran to the soldier, and he spoke to him in Hebrew and says, I'm hungry. Allah saved them, these people. I mean, he easily can, would have killed him. The, the soldier gave him... She said, like a piece of cookie this size and a little bit of water. So when she saw her son up, she said, I went up and I said, Ya Allah, you saved me because all the soldiers are up. She went up. When the sun was there, next to them were tank. And the tank was open. 
the son jumped on the tank, tank, wanted to see what's inside the tank. Wow. I looked at him and says, he said, yeah, I wanted to see. What are they going to do to me? This is how they talk to you. What are they going to do to me? They're going to kill me. They are scared from me. This is how they answer, 12-year-old. And he said, I looked down, and the soldier in the tank pushed back. He was scared. And his mom grabbed him and took him. She said, when we went down, walked till we reached about 10, 15 minutes from the hospital. And then the hospital, because they know that there's an area where all the displays, they call them, they come and they pick her up. Now, what is the, the amazing part of the story is not what I told you. It's what she told me at the end. She looked at me and she said, you know what? This life is nothing. I never lived even before this, for this life. I lived for Jannah. Wallahi, I have it uh, uh, recorded. And I want to go to Jannah. This life is going to end. Today, tomorrow, this is how she was talking to me. Today, tomorrow, we all are going. And that's why we sleep with our hijab. And I said, why? She said, so when we are dead, we are covered. She even looked at me and she started reciting al waqia I was like, what is this? What is this? Then I looked at the boy and I said, weren't you scared from the soldier? No. Do you really know Quran? Yeah, I know four ajza. And he started reciting for me. Then I went back to this woman who really stayed in, in my mind. Where did we pray taraweeh and tahajjud? And who was the imam? The call room is where sleeping. There is a court, there's like an opening before you get to their room. Don't ask me how clean and not clean. That's not the issue. We prayed there. We prayed tahajjud from one to three under two options either the drones, and the drone sounds like that all the time, 24 7. If you don't hear that voice, you need to be very scared because that means bombing is coming. That's what they told us. Because we kept saying, what is this? What is this? They said, oh, alhamdulillah, you're hearing it. There's no bombing. Get scared when you don't hear it. So the, the, the Abdullah, his name, and I thought he was, he was like a nurse or a physician in the hospital. Last day I spoke to him. He said, no, I'm displaced. I just moved from the north. I've been living in this room, I don't know since when. And Abdullah Hafil, and I said, Abdullah, mashallah, you're half, he's like 22, 23, alone. Where is the family? Don't ask me. And I said, you're Hafil. Look what he said to me. He said, I'm not Hafil, I'm from a Safwa. Safwa, the special, the chosen. And I said, what does that mean? He said, in Gaza, we have this tradition. When people finish memorizing the Quran, there's a couple, this group, who then what, once you do this, they will call you a hafiz. And I said, you do what? He said, you recite the whole Quran in one sitting. In one setting. And I said, really? He said, yeah. The norm is 8 to 2 p.m. And I said, how about you? He said, I was a little bit longer because I just made a little bit of mistakes. And I said, and how long was that? He said, eight to four. That Abdullah, every night he did tahajjud for us from one to three. Perfect recitation, beautiful talk about the dua. I normally, normally, I don't feel much when other people are making dua because I want to, I want to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except with this man. Ya Allah, when he was making dua for Allah to lift this. Ya Allah, sabburna. He used to say, Ya Allah, give us patience. Give us patience till your victory comes in. Look at the dua. Give us patience till our, your victory comes in. Long. Who did we meet in one of the nights? can't remember which night was it. It was 2 a.m. Suddenly, because we are in the back, only me and the other physician. And a young boy, 13-year-old, 
comes in 2 a.m. alone. Join the Taraweeh. 12 years, 13. Oh, kullahum 12, 13. They act like 30, if not 40, of the men here. Finished the two rukats, Abdullah. He looked at him. The young boy went to him. Now we, then we understood he wanted to lead. And Abdullah allowed him to lead. He led. Taraweeh to rukat. Reading, amazing. Finished. I was so confident. And this is under between bombing and drones. Don't forget that. This is the background for 10 days. And then he started doing an ashid about Palestine. The love of Palestine. I don't remember because we're all crying. Who was that boy? There was a boy on social media. I'm sure you all seen his video. They were doing cast for his arm. And he was reciting Quran. Have you seen it? That was the boy. Where is his family? All gone. They divide the casualties or the, the survivors there into three categories. And they even have like letters for them. The first category is single children with no living parents. Alone. The child is alone. And you talk about 11 or 12. We saw one, they put his video recently on, who was, I, I talked with him, I think he told me either 10, 9 or 10. He was wearing scrubs. Did you see that video? And I, and I joked with him and I was like, oh, mashallah, the young physician. And he looked at me, yeah, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon in Arabic. Alone lost everyone living in this hospital. What does he do? He pushed the patient's beds to the OR. Where does he sleep? What does he eat? What shower he takes? If there is something called shower, what about the feelings? What about the anxiety? Don't talk about these things. These are luxury. Subhanallah. The day that the world kitchen, you all heard about it, so Monday and Tuesday, there was no food. From where, where our room was, there was a window. I can look and I see the street. And the norm mode of transportation is what? A BMW, right? It's usually, usually it's a donkey. And the donkey either alone or the donkey is pulling a carriage. The donkey itself needs to retire. Old, probably not fed, definitely not clean. So I used to see, especially before iftar, and you see one shop, it's not a shop, it's one place at the door of the hospital where they uh, uh, present what they have. And one day my friend looked at me and says, do you see eggs? This was like four days after we arrived. And I said, I think this looks like eggs. Eggs, we ran down. I bought four eggs and I paid for it, four dollars, four eggs. Others, they don't know what eggs means. Two days, this is all after the death of those, where you can start. Because when we came through the border, there were a huge line of trucks, all has things, but they were not inside. The next day, or two days later, for my, my friend was working in the yard, texted me and said, there is orange. And I said, orange? She said, yes. Went down to buy an orange, only one place. I bought five oranges for $5. The head nurse, the head nurse of the maternity, and the second one, they all work in the hospital 24 hours you don't go home in between come back it's very unsafe so they stay for 24 hours then they go for three four days and then they come back and allah knows if they will come back so i was with them talking and she said i said where do you live she said i live about 15 minutes walk from the hospital we live in a farm absolutely at the border between us and the um the other side 
And I said, yeah, oh, alhamdulillah, she, a farm. Look at me. And she said, yeah, half of the farm. It's not ours. I said, what do you mean? She said, we cannot get close to it. If we get close to it, we'll be dead. It's like a free zone, but it's their place. And they cannot plant, they can do anything in it. And the rest we can. She said, I had three children. And the three children got sick. And please forgive me, they had diarrhea. So I needed to buy diapers for them. She bought the diapers for $60. Each one package. She said 180 shekels, about $50. And I said, what is your salary? 800 shekels. She said the whole salary went for the diapers. And there's questions you just can't ask anymore. I mean, human dignity. So she, she as if she, 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 learned, and he, she, she figured out what I want to say. And she says, Alhamdulillah, we have farm and we eat from the farm. We used to have chickens, chickens like, like treasure. We used to have chickens, they killed them all. Then I met a girl, as I go to my, I mean, there's stories and stories. As I go in the corridor to go to my room, she, nine years old, legs is all wounded. And I think they saved her leg. I think the team with us, the vascular surgeon, saved her leg. And as I go, she smiles and she greets you. And what's your name in Arabic? Nine-year-old. So I gave her my name, right? Every morning. Then one day she looked at me and says, do you see how happy I am? And I said, yeah, why? She says, I'm going to go to Egypt to get treated. And I said, who's going with you? I don't know but at least I'm gonna get treated. Nine year old, what they should be happy for? Nine year old, right? Literally, those children, their childhood stripped from them. I didn't see a child. I saw a child, but I did not see a child. There's no child whining about ice cream or the food is not good or whatever we whine about. Subhanallah. This woman who I told you the day one that she was on the side of the, of the entrance of the hospital, every time we go for tahajjud, her, her mattress is right there. And she is sitting on the mattress. So I was like, I'm gonna talk to this lady. So one day actually somebody, this was like three days before we leave, somebody got us cookies, they baked it at home. Wallahi, when I saw the cookie, I can't tell you. I was like, cookie, something fresh. Rabbi. Yeah, he was reminding us of what we have and how ungrateful and how we take things for granted. So I had two. I was coming, I looked at the lady and I said, Khala, do you want one? I said, sure. Okay, alhamdulillah. Then I asked her and she said, from the 7th of October, we were living in Gaza. And everybody, when they tell you we're living in Gaza, like, you know, I was living in California. And we had to leave. I took not much with me. And I came in here. And she looked at me and says, I've been living in here for the last six months. And I said, where do you go for bathroom? She said, with the patients. What do you eat? Whatever they get me. Where is your family? She said, my daughter with me, she was next to her, and the other are in Gaza. I don't know what's going to happen to us. And you look at her, of course, covered completely. They all wear the prayer. Have you ever seen it? They all wear the same. Everybody. Everybody. Subhanallah. There was one night the most scared. I thought I am not, we're not going to make it. It was so scary. It was nonstop drones and bombing, drones and bombing. And they were threatening that they will invade. 
And I remember when I was praying my Isha, yeah, because th that night I think we didn't go yet for Taraweeh. They said, pray Isha in your room and let's see what's, what are we going to do. I remembered when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Fatih, هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَزْدَادُ إِيمَانًا مَعَ إِيمَانِهِمْ You all read this. He is the one who sent tranquility to the heart of the believers. We read it, but we don't know what it means, right? I remember uh, that night, I made all that dua to Allah, just make me feel serene. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible, but Ya Allah, you are capable. Make me feel serene, so at least I can pray, at least I can make dua. And khalas, if this is how it is, if this is how it is, we're all going to die. But it was one of the most scariest night, and this was nothing, because this morning they texted me and they said, you should see the last two nights. Because if you heard now, they are getting to the middle. And Nusayrat, the camp, is about 10 minutes walk from the hospital. And they are bombing and bombing and bombing. The day before I left, they said, we can take you to the maternity hospital today. It looks, it is a little bit quieter. Because there were, this was the day of negotiation. I think it was Sunday when they were in Egypt negotiating. When there is negotiation usually, you get a little bit better, but then it gets very worse. They're so scared when it gets better. They say, if it gets quiet, then that means we will get it. So I went to the hospital. Of course, you go with the um, ambulance. And literally, you say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Because you don't know what is going to come on your head. Streets, no streets. No streets. They're either bombed on the right, on the left. Every, things are standing. Things are lower. We get to the hospital. The hospital looks from the outside still intact. Looks nice, new. So when I entered, went to the second floor, and they were, and they said, oh, there, yeah, this is the private hospital. that It opened only two years ago. We used to do private hospitals, so we used to do maybe five deliveries a day. And then they looked at me and said, and now 50 delivery a day, because there's no other place to deliver. They do between nine to 10 C-sections a day. I did two in that day. So I go to the OR. And what do I see? And I just did the C-section yesterday here. And when I was doing it yesterday, I was like, Ya Allah, aren't they human being? Are human beings only here? Wallahi. The woman they brought her, there is nothing on that table. I mean, if any of you had surgery, you know there's always sheets and then they put pads, right? It's more comfortable, it's drier, it's humanity. Right? So usually, this is under. There was nothing under that. They put her on, on the leather, which is usually very cold. طيب. Alhamdulillah, they had anesthesia. They did. And they gave her a um, spinal. I don't know how good it was, because she was feeding. But not shouting, but that's it. And then, they opened a green cover. And I didn't say anything, because at that point, I was like, don't think of America. This is very different. For those of you who have seen, or you can go on Google, usually when we do surgeries, they bring the instruments in a container, and the container is usually covered with sheets. It's part of the sterilizing process, right? That's usually in here, is usually taken aside or thrown. And then you have sheets to cover the patient. None. And this surgeon looked at me and says, we are creative. The need makes you think better. It was, I have a picture of it. It's the green, long, they cut it in the middle to the point where you can see the C-section wound. And that was it. Her legs were, not her legs, her foot was shown. Normally you don't, you cover the patient fully. Where is the cautery? It's a, an instrument we use to stop bleeding. And they said, we don't use it. Gloves. I normally do five and a half. I said, I'm sorry, Dr. there's only seven and a half. Seven and a half. It's double my size. I did the C-section with seven and a half. Do you have antibiotic? They say, yes. I said, what do you give them for pain medication? Whatever is available. Then at, as we finished the C-section, they called us to the recovery room. 
because there was a patient who was bleeding. What is the recovery room? I don't know if they call it recovery room. No monitors. You know when you do surgery, if any of you have done surgery or you visit somebody surgery, there's usually monitors. None. None. There's no blood pressure cuff. And I just literally, you know, you know, when 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 you are in a nowhere, so I just because she was bleeding, and I just touched her pulse, I said, No, her pulse is okay. Just give her a fluid. And there is nothing to hold the fluid in. Somebody was holding the fluid. There is no blood testing in that hospital. Literally, me and uh, Dr. Hina and I was like, she said, nothing. I said, you can do a CBC? She said, nothing. They don't have it. We, you really have to think, use your judgment. That's how it is. That's how it is. You talk to the physicians and everybody, they say, you know what? That's what we have. We will work. What is the casualties? What is the casualties? They say, the numbers you're seeing, these are the accounted for. They accounted for. There's at least double or triple that number under the rubbles. Or those who were, and it's very gross, the woman, that the woman who was walking next to the uh, sea, she said, by Allah, by Allah, I saw dead people and the dogs were eating them. SubhanAllah. And she was right, because there was talk about that. She said, I saw it with my own eyes, and that 12-year-old saw that. What trauma this 12-year-old will have. So they say the casualties, that's the 33, 34. There's at least double. We estimate, they were the, like, the representative of the Ministry of Health was telling us, we estimate 75 to 80,000. And the number is much higher, because there's people who already have already decayed if they died on October 10th, they're gone. This is six months now. And I said, do you think this will come back? And how long it will take? He said, we, we looked at that. He said, if the war stops today, and this was last Tuesday, it will take two years to remove the rubbles if the people have the right instruments and they work 24-7 because they live all, they live in buildings, and the buildings are not, um, it's not wood. They all are, they build with brick and cement. So this is heavy. He said two years to remove everything and at least five years to get to back to where people can live in homes. I said, what about education? Schools are either done or people are living in schools. This is what I loved. The, the strength. He looked at me and he said, well, the world lived during COVID and they didn't go to school. We can do the same. In every camp, tents, group of tents, you know what they did? One tent, they make the, the kids memorize Quran and read Quran. And if there is a teacher, we'll teach them. If there is a teacher, we'll teach them. And, and when we went the last day, they moved us for security. They moved us from the middle. They moved us to the south, to Rafah. And we were there. And then we saw a big tent. And they said, this is the Quran tent. And I said, what does that mean? He said, the Quran tent is where the kids during the day go to there, read or memorize or review. When was the last time you read Quran since Eid? You hear it all the time, all the time. I didn't hear music. I didn't hear singing at all for 10 days. And if any, anybody feels down and they need entertainment, it should be them. Everyone I interviewed, they said, and I'm going to end up with you, they said, talk about it. Don't forget us. Talk about it, whatever you can do. Allah will give us victory. They all say this. We just don't know when. Victory is going to come. But meanwhile, everybody talk about it. 
post. They love what we post because they know there's people think of them and remember them. Imagine if you and me, may Allah protect us and never get us tested the way they are. We are all living in here. This is literally how it is. All of us living in this room with one bathroom and you can't go outside and minimum food. How do you feel? And the internet is extremely choppy. And this is we, we are in the hospital. But people outside, they have to go and buy a SIM for one hour to see what is going on in the world and they follow the news. And so imagine if we are here, all of us, stuck in here, bombing on our head. No one cares about us. And then in this one hour when they are on the net, they see someone speak about us. How do you feel? So don't you get numb. Don't you say it's too long. Don't you say it's not to me. No, it is us. These are our brothers and sisters. One day could be you and me. May Allah protect us. There is no guarantee in this world. And the most important thing, and this is actually the reason I went, is when I am in front of Allah, I said, Ya Allah, I did everything I can. Did you? Did you, each one of you did everything in your ability? You can't go and fight. I can't go and fight. But can each one of you do something to those people? The answer is... usual. Can't be. At least we feel. At least your dua. At least whatever help you can. Anything. They said, send us anything. They even took my scrubs, shoes, everything they took. We literally, most of the team came in with at least two or three suitcases. We went back with our backpack or carry on. So don't get numb. Don't take it casual. Don't tell me it's not my issue. It is an issue. It's an issue of injustice, number one. It's an issue of genocide. It's a clear genocide. Why do you target legs of people? Why do you target children? Why do you make them starve? Why do you cut the water on them? They are civilians in hospitals. So this is what we all need. And teach your children everything about Palestine. Talk to your co-workers. I showed the physician this morning, I showed her pictures of the C-section and the video. She, she was in tears. I said, talk to the representatives. Put pressure, even if nothing happened. At least in front of Allah, I'm going to say, Ya Allah, I tried. And I did everything in my ability. I didn't take it numb. I didn't say it's not my cause. I didn't say I don't care. None of us say I don't care. Audu billah. But I can't do anything. No, we can. Whatever we can. The result is not in our hand. The result in Allah's hand. But the effort is what he want, want from me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and really don't forget them in your dua. Ya Allah, irfa' al-ghumma an hadhi al-umma. Remove this, remove this test, remove this tragedy, remove this atrocity from the brothers and sisters. They all say, la ilaha illallah. Allah, I don't know about you, but I can buy Allah's name. They are all better than me. And their relationship with Allah, the ones I saw, their relationship with Allah and their faith and their, they, 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 they're amazing. The, the, the war brought the best in them. Subhanallah. I wonder if it was us, what it's going to come out of us. So don't forget them in dua. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, inna ka'ala kulli shay'in qadir. Kun fayakun. Amra ka bayna kun fayakun. Just say, kun ya Allah, stop it. Enough is enough. That's what the head nurse was telling me. Doctor Ta'abna. This is exactly what she said in Arabic. We're so tired. And I don't blame them. Ten days was like I lived, I aged ten years. Imagine those people with no end of the tunnel and not a single person did not lose a member of their family. Not a single person I spoke to. So this is why I made this. It's not just to make you feel sad. No, we need to be aware of what's going and do whatever you can. You speak to the students with you in the school. Don't be political. Just, just present facts, what I just shared with you. These are human beings like you and me. Every human being deserve, deserve decent life, respect, food, water. Every child should have, should not be an orphan by eight and nine. 
Why? So don't take it lightly. Do your best. Talk about it. Keep talking. Send letters. Put pressure on your uh, representatives. Nothing happened in front of Allah. I did. In front of Allah, I tried. It changes. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullahu khayran. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha ila an. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi tasliman kathira. If anybody has any question, I'll be 